Uh, this is a public hearing on the 40B application. Uh, we opened this public hearing on July 24, 2014. Since that time, we've had uh, three additional public hearings, September 30th, November 6th, November 25th, and this evening, uh, December 16th. Uh, my name is Brian Hurley. I've been acting as the chairman in connection with this 40B application. Uh, to my left is Mr. Ted Daber. To my right, Mr. Frank O'Brien, and the three of us comprise the board for the purposes of this application. Just some housekeeping matters. Since our last meeting on December 25th, um, we have received a couple of bits of additional uh, information uh, since that hearing. We had received several things on the evening of the 25th itself, but since the hearing, we received a, a parking plan memorandum dated December 11, 2014, uh, prepared by or on behalf of the applicant. And, and today we received, uh, I received by email, and I think the rest of the members of the board received by email uh, a copy of a letter uh, from Joseph Lynch, the director of uh, the Milton Department of Public Works, um, uh, addressing uh, a number of issues. And, and Peter, I, I trust that you have seen a copy of that December 16, 2014 letter from, yes, from Mr. Lynch. Okay. Great. Now, I understand that the, that the fire chief is here this evening and, and wanted to uh, assist us and address some issues that came up at the, at the last session of the public hearing. And rather than have you sit around, I'm sure you probably have some other things to do. Uh, uh, why, don't you, why don't we hear from you first? Could I just, one real quick. Sure. We do have Kevin Hastings here also, and we do have a corrected memo. We had submitted the memo last time, but Kevin did, when he went over it, realized that he had a miscalculation, and so he has revised the memo, which I just wanted to tell you, rather, rather than submitting it now, perhaps you can wait until the chief uh, discusses it and you have questions, but I just want to let you know that okay. Kevin will submit that and, you know, explain further. Great. Um, there had been some questions the last time about the comparison between this project and 88 Wharf, and um, and then the, the concerns that um, have been expressed to the board by the town on behalf of the fire chief. And so you had asked last time about whether or not the fire chief could attend, and so we very nicely took some time to schedule to come and talk to the board about the concerns that he has with the project. Um. Yeah, if we, if we want to start off with, uh, with 88 Wharf Street, I actually have some pictures that I'll, I'll slide up to you. This is a, one picture of uh, each side of the structure. Um, and you can see that there is access for us on all four sides of that building. Uh, you know, one thing to clarify when I'm saying access, I'm, I'm not necessarily talking about apparatus access to everything. Uh, although with 88 Wharf Street, we do have access to half the building with apparatus. Uh, and the other half, as you can see, gives us uh, plenty of room to do ground ladder operations and uh, uh, get hose lines stretched around that point. And that's my main concern uh, with the Elliott Street project is that with that proximity to the tracks and being right on uh, that lot line, that uh, we don't have an option for either. I, I don't have the option to get apparatus back there, and I really have very limited ability to throw ground ladders back there as well. Uh, in reality, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't be able to get above a second floor uh, with, uh, with what's there currently. On the side of the building that's adjacent to the tracks? That runs along the tracks, okay. yes. Yeah, and then in combination, like I say, oh, oh, like I pointed out that first night, if that mm -hmm. commercial structure was ever to go in on the Milton piece of property, we have zero access there either. So uh, again, that basically takes away 50% of that building for us. But that's a constant, though. No matter what goes on the Henry site, there's always that potential uh, that that, that side's going to be lost. There's that potential that that side would be lost, but if we're dealing with uh, part of the problem from my aspect is that the 40B process allows you to bypass the zoning regulations. So if, if you're going with a, a regular building that's not outside the zoning, you're going to have setbacks. And, and that's what I would like to see as those setbacks. That, that would make, you know, that makes all the difference. It allows us to get in and get ground, ground ladder placement. You are correct that we would still be limited on that side of the building. Now, 
the testimony that we heard last time, and I'll correct me if I'm wrong, Frank, or, or Ted, from, the, from Mr. Hastings, was that, um, that it was really based on the fire code. Mm -hmm. And what we were told is that uh, essentially the, the fire code didn't require what it is that you say that you would, you would need or you would like to have from, mm -hmm. from your perspective. How do, how do you address that sort of tension? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I will say, starting off with the statement that you had said, that I have not cross-referenced uh, this document and the new NFPA 1, but, you know, that being said, most of the, you know, barring any just typos in there, you know, it, it's certainly language that appears to come out of NFPA 1. Uh, and I wouldn't dispute the code. Uh, what I would say here in the town of Milton, that that zoning law provides us that extra margin of safety here. We're largely built as a single family residential firefighting force here. Uh, and anything that's beyond that, the, the buildings that we have that exist to date that are of similar size as what we're talking about, all have access around the building. Uh, we're, you know, we're just not structured uh, to, to handle it differently. So, you know, the fact that it is usurping the zoning laws, I, that's where I have an issue. And I, I, I accept that the building code says otherwise. So is it an equipment issue? That we, you, we just don't have the equipment in Milton? No, we have the equipment. It's more a manpower issue. Okay. Uh, you know, we have those size ladders. Uh, you know, we're, if you compare us to the city of Boston, uh, you, you take a structure in the city that may very well have other structures on either side of it and, and doesn't have the access that we have. They have numerous ladder companies, fully staffed ladder companies in the city. Uh, you know, they're, they're more prepared to work ground ladders, they're more prepared to work above the, above the fire floor. Uh, again, you know, we're so limited with what we have, we need as much access as we can get. Chief, I'm, I'm, I'm confused now uh, because based upon your, your prior appearance before the board and uh, some other conversations, um, I was left with the distinct impression that your concern was the structure of the building and your inability to throw appropriately sized ground ladders because of lack of a setback in the presence of the overhead electrical cables. Mm -hmm. Am I corrected by recollection? Yes. Now you're saying today that it's not really, you, you have a different concern or additional concern. Are you saying today that if the town fielded a four-man ladder company that you would not have the same concern? No, no, I'm not okay, saying. Okay, uh, help me. Help okay, me. what I'm saying there. I'm not a firefighter, so help me alleviate my confusion. Okay, but we're still we're still looking at throwing ground ladders. We're throwing the ladders here with minimum manpower. Okay, it's we're stealing from an engine company to get a large ground ladder thrown, even if we have the room to do it, which is the current setup does not allow. Okay. So, so let me, let, excuse me, let me stop, let me stop you right there, because this is where my confusion is. So you're saying right now the way that the building is physically designed mm -hmm. is that either under current manning, current manning or optimal manning, you would not have the ability to throw a ground ladder no matter how many people you have? Is that no, what I'm you're saying? I'm not saying that, okay. no. No, I'm saying as the building currently stands, I'm we're, we're kind of talking yeah. two different things here. Okay. As the building currently stands right on that lot line, you can give me 12 people geared just to throwing that ground ladder, and we can't do it. Okay. okay. I'm, now I'm talking about in conjunction with the code, how we function and why I still prefer to have this setback. Uh, we're, we're not in, in interior work in getting additional manpower around the building to attack it in other ways, we're not structured that way. Okay, and when you say we're not structured that way, do you mean that the town of Milton 
as the fire department is currently organized and manned is not up to the job? Is not up to the job of? of providing proper fire protection for this particular building if it's ever We'll ever do the built. best we can. Is that a possibility? Yeah, it's a possibility in any structure that you're going to be understaffed. It's a possibility in a two-story single-family house. Would building this building keep you awake at night? As it's currently structured, it would give me pause. It wouldn't keep me up, but it would certainly give me pause. <laughs> I'm going to sleep. You guys are going to make your decisions. I fought my fight. I'm going to have a clear <laughs> conscience when I leave here. Thank you, Chief. Ted? Um, I have no questions. Peter, do you have any questions to the Chief? Uh, no questions, but I would point out, which may lead to a question, so uh, Kurt, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, first, I think, as I understand the questions and the answers, that basically there's agreement with our memo, and, and so there's just a slight correction, but it doesn't change the substance, that code-wise we comply, but you're concerned about the practical aspect of reaching. I'm concerned about the practical. The from, yes. Right, the practical yes. from. So the one thing architecturally that I want Kurt to correct if I'm wrong, but I'll point out, that there is uh, more separation than what the plan seems just on the site plan because the first level is that parking structure. So the building, the residential units themselves are set back. Uh, if you can tell us how many feet, show it out, so that you actually could set ladders, aside from the manpower problem, but physically you could set ladders that would actually go to where the residential structures are on the track side. So, Kurt, uh, <coughs> point that out. Is this a set of plans that's currently part of the record? Yes, it is. Okay. So this is the parking level plan, and although you can see the property line and the dash line here, and the path that was, we've measured it is on the property. Only a portion of the uh, property line is, uh, is on top of the retaining wall that borders the MBTA line. At some point, um, and, and the, the wall is not far above grade at this point and inclines until it gets to this little elbow. And then this wall is actually several feet away from the property line into the layout of the railway. Um, and that is the taller of the retaining walls. So the track is some distance below this. Um, but I wanted to point out that there is um, six foot of separation from the property line and another four or so feet of level grade on our property side of that retaining wall. Again, I, I started on the parking level because this is the foundation level plan and the, at this corner of the site and at the, along the back edge, this is the perimeter of the building. But I want to take you up one more floor. And again, direct you to the portion of the building that faces and, and is parallel with the railway. And the building elevation moves back and forth with the bay windows. And in fact, all the bedrooms uh, that face this direction, with the exception of sort of that one that faces the neighbor to the west, and this uh, one here that is sort of on the corner, um, are approximately nine feet back from the edge of the parking deck at grade. So again, this little railing here is at the perimeter of the parking deck below, but the building surface itself in the facade is set back this entire length, or sorry, 80% of that entire length, an additional nine feet, or in this case, five feet to the bay window in the living rooms. So I wanted to point out that although 
it seems like a six foot property buffer, majority of it's 10, and then even along that area that is um, at the six foot setback, there's an additional 10 foot setback to the face of the building for the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth floors above the parking deck. Thanks, that's, that's really all I wanted to point out. Chief, your, your thoughts on that? I'm, I'm not clear as to what I'm looking at there. <laughs> um, the very extreme left end of the building, how far is that from, the, from that wall? 10 feet. That's 10 feet to the drop off. Correct. Okay, and same on the other end. Yes, no, it's six foot there, but at that point the wall is only about four to five foot above grade and sort of inclining. So the wall starts there and inclines up to this point. What's the, I'm lost on it, what's the significance of the incline? If, if I'm picturing this, so I'm a firefighter, I've got a ladder, I've got a teammate, we're carrying the ladder down, we set it. The height of the wall doesn't really matter, does it? It's just the fact that the wall is there, that's as far back as I can put the bottom of the ladder. Right. What I wanted to point out was that actually you, if you came down the tracks, if say there was another building here at some point and you came down the tracks, several men carrying a ladder, you could get behind the building and be on a grade that's inclining up to the level area that returns around. So this area right from about here all the way around is at, an L, as a, at grade level just just below the first floor and one story above the parking. So at this point, this is at parking level and the grade inclines on our side of the wall up to a level area here. So there's a portion of the building where you probably couldn't put a ladder because it's inclining anyway, currently and in the future. And then once you get to this point and you got the ladder up to this level, you could incline a ladder from here to these bedrooms, areas that are recessed back. Since it doesn't go straight up, you wouldn't have a ladder going like this. Right. You could tilt it back like that. I guess that's the point. And perhaps at this area, because of the incline on our side of the MBTA re retaining wall, the ladder may have to go on the track level. And how, how high are you saying that the retaining wall is there? We may be thinking of two different things here. At this end of the building, Chris, Chris has got some topographic you know, grade points, uh, but the wall is not that tall down at this end of the building and is inclining up to about 10 feet high there. I, I think I have it at 10 feet a whole lot sooner than that, but I don't, I don't, that's just by visibility. It's around 37 at the highest point, so then the tracks are down at 25, so it's... Tracks at 25 here, 25, top of the wall is at 37, yeah. so that's a 12 foot wall. And then by the time you get to that track corner, yep. Did you see the tracks are at 24, obviously, and the wall is uh, around 26. It's like a, it, it almost trans it transitions into a two foot. Yeah. So, so, you're right, it, it, it so it's a two foot wall here, wall and it slopes, slopes up to a 12 foot wall. At that corner where it jogs out, the top of the wall is 32, almost 33. Tracks are at 24, 24, 24 and a half. And lastly, we would point out that actually the construction of this building is different than 88 Wharf, which is masonry and steel. This is all wood. Um, so different level of concern because of the nature of the construction. But it's still going to be compliant with all the fire sprinklers and everything else for that type of construction. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as Mr. Hastings pointed out last week. Mr. Chairman, the only other thing I think, unless Kevin, you want to say more, is just to submit the memo and just briefly explain because, you know, there's no real disagreement on it. It's just there was a figure that turns out is a different figure, but, you know, we have the adequate, okay. you know. Is this a substitute for the yeah, original memo? I believe you substituted the whole thing. Yes. yes. Okay. So this is not part of the record right now? Not yet. Okay. Nope. I ask a question in the meantime? Can I ask a question sure. in the meantime? Um, so, 
you, you mentioned the zoning setbacks as providing, you know, necessary distance where zoning applies. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, and I think I may have asked you this last time, but I just want to confirm. So, I think you said that to, you prefer to have, what, a 20-foot setback? To I, I would say I probably said 12. Oh, 12 feet? I think I said 12. 12 allows us to, say, throw a 35-foot yeah, ground right. ladder and, okay. and work off of it. Okay. And, and by, by the, his explanation there about the upper floors, um, the elevation of the upper floors being set back um, further than the, than the ground level, I mean, does that, could, could you consider that as being part of the 12 feet that you like to have? I, I can't answer that at this point. I, you, I really, we'd have to get a better look as to how it lies, again, with that retaining wall. If, if we have to still set that ladder on the track, we still, again, in a lot of that, you're, you're 12 feet up, so it still takes us, you know, down a full floor. Uh, so it's, it's a question I can't really clearly answer. Okay. All right, thank you. That was it. Thank you. Uh, before Kevin says a few words just on that zoning setback, remember it is actually six feet. We were pointing out that it's five feet is what we have. So we have requested a small waiver, but it's actually a six foot setback there under the existing zoning in the business district. Say that again, Pat. The, the zoning bylaw doesn't require a 20 foot setback there, it requires a six foot setback. So we have five, we have asked for that waiver for that distance, but it's not a 20 foot zoning requirement. So it's just a one foot waiver you're asking for? In that it's location? a little over one at this point. Yeah. We'll make it five. It says it came out as 4.9. I mean, what I would say when we jump ahead to drafting a decision, I always say as per plan, you know, because I don't want some very de minimis, you know, miscalculation to force us to come back. But certainly in terms of you knowing what you're doing in terms of, you know, when we get to that point, it's it's just about five, five feet versus the six in the bylaw. Okay. Did you want to speak? Um, yeah, just real quickly. So the just basically there's one small change where in our initial memo we had, the, the, the thing I said last time, the new mass fire code is an amended version of NFPA 1. So NFPA 1 says from either of the fire lanes, which in this point are the two public roads, you need to be able to get to um, any side of the building within 450 feet. And one of the master's amendments that we didn't incorporate correctly the first time reduces it to 250 feet. But the fact of the matter is you can still get from Elliott or um, Central Ave to the back of the building within 250 feet. So it doesn't change compliance, just a, a number change basically to the requirement. So I think just from the only, the only amended the only amended section was really that paragraph at the very bottom of the first page. Is the one that begins fire department access is required. Uh, actually, that, that there was that was a yeah. There was one tweak in there which says 250 was changed to 450, right? Yeah, yeah. And then the yeah. then this paragraph below that, everything else is the same. Okay. You still can't get get in between the if something goes up on the town piece. There's only five feet there, right? Yeah. On that L shape on that side. But Kevin, isn't it correct that the FICO doesn't? differentiate whether or not there is or might be a building in the future. Yeah, as far as that, I mean, in terms of you're talking about that little... Uh, well, yeah, I mean, that just I know we only have like five feet on that um, <coughs> on that east and um, and north side, on the east side of the and building. Perpendicular from central along the back of our yeah, building, yeah, and the other side is the... Right, yeah. that and out to the track is only five, right, from the east side line? Right. At its narrowest, yeah. Is that right? Is it five feet? Six here, five point six there, but the engineer's got it at four point eight. We showed it four point eight at its tightest, very tightest, which is right right around here. Mm -hmm. But again, that you know, based on you know the skin of the building and you know how we finally get the final footprint of whatever we're gonna you know, build here, that'll be five. You know, we'll set that. When it comes to construction documents, I know just one thing to point out. When I looked at the building too, that 
if you look at where the stairs are, you, at least for a positive, you don't have stairs discharging to that back area so that you won't have occupants discharging out the back of the building and trying to go anywhere. Um, I think, I mean, I, I can't really imagine a scenario where you'd try and tuck through there. If you really had to get to the back, you'd probably walk down the tracks where you wouldn't try and you know, turn that corner, even though you can, could physically do it. But the, the Chief, if you, if you guys had to get to the T side of the building, so say this building gets built as a fire, mm -hmm. you got to get over there. How would you? How would they do it? They'd park the trucks where and walk from where to where with carrying ladders. Just I'm trying to picture this. Okay, we would just like say say a third, third floor apartment back there. Sure. Uh, you'd prefer to get a truck parked somewhere down on that corner there. Uh, on, like on when it. you take the the L section. You know, you'd, you'd prefer to get a, a truck back there, and you'd actually Should prefer to get a truck on the other corner of the back building. Um, you know, in this one. On the west end, where the houses are. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, we can't that do that. That would be my preference. There's a, there's a house there. Okay. So what would we what would we have to do? We'd have to take a position in the front of the building, and you know, work our lines up through. Um, that's that's all we have. But that would be true even if the building were further set back, wouldn't it? I mean, as far as advancing lines, yes, okay. yeah. Because what okay. we're going to do is we're going to go. We could go through that front. There's going to be standpipes in in the hallways, you know, so we can take our line from the hallway and in. What we're really talking about here is, you get a fire condition or with a sprinkled building, a heavy smoke condition where you've got to evacuate people from above that fire, uh, that we've got, to use, we've got to use ladder work from that back of that building, and, and that's really not going to be possible. Ryan, two questions. Chief, I, I'm sorry, and I, I feel like an uneducated amateur here in terms of, um, so bear with me about some of these questions. They, mm -hmm. The only dumb question is the one that isn't asked. The first thing, um, given the size of the fire department, assume alarm, an alarm comes in for this particular building. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't normal procedure be for the companies to go to the front of the building and then proceed through the structure that way? And if there was a an emergency in the back would when additional arriving companies take the stuff uh, in the back no not all, not all companies would go to the front you prefer it to start surrounding the building on your on your initial alarm if you can okay the second thing is is there any particular piece of equipment when i when you're talking about ground ladders mm -hmm. i'm i'm just envisioning my 20 foot, you know, mm -hmm. ladder. I <laughs> yep, perfectly <laughs> understandable. And I'm, I'm sh I would assume that firefighting ladders are bigger, heavier, that sort of thing. We, yes, you know what, uh, your 20, 24 foot ladder is a perfect example. Uh, we have that size on the truck. It's going to be a much heavier gauge ladder than what yours at home is. Uh, but we also carry up to 50 foot ladders on the trucks. Is there any particular piece of ladder equipment or other equipment that would make your job easier on this thing? The other thing that's in the back of my mind is that we're talking about um, metal ladders in an environment where there, I assume, uh, live <laughs> wires overhead, overhead electrical <laughs> lines. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I mean, uh, what is the provision? for the safety of your firefighters in that particular instance when we have over live overhead cables. It's going to, again, that's going to hamper the effort. You know, you're going to be delayed. Uh, I don't know how long the delay would be to operate. Again, we, at this point, we're talking about operating from the track grade. Uh, so you're right. You know, we've got to make sure that, that, uh, that the power to the T is killed. And there is capability to do that, um, you know, how, how much that sets us back. Uh, is beyond me, but uh, you know, like I say, a bigger concern than that because we will get the power killed uh, is the fact that you know, especially at that 12 foot end, um, you're losing 
a, a whole floor's worth of access. That 12 feet is basically adds a whole story to that building from that ground ladder perspective. You know what I'm saying? If, if, if I was to throw a 35 foot ground ladder from level ground, I'm going to access the third floor. If level ground is 12 feet above where I'm starting, my best is I'm getting to the second floor. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Okay. Anyone else have any questions of, of the chief or comments? Just, just, just one in the same preface as uh, was just stated. Obviously, I'm not a firefighter, but your example. But you do have 50 foot ladders, so that's actually going to get to the fourth floor. <laughs> yep. Uh, in a perfect world, you're right, uh, but. Going down there, if you if you get on and measure this, and I did, uh, the wi the overhead wire is eight foot off that wall. Throwing a thirty five foot ladder to its full extension, you're going to be out seven feet to the base of it. So even <clears throat> even though you've you're not at that eight feet, you you know you've got to get it up there and you've got to work off it. It doesn't give us enough space. A fifty foot ladder is going it, to it's not possible. We're going to be into that wiring. I'm not sure. That I follow that. The electrical Plus, wires. No, I know, for what the, the, I know what wires we're talking about. Right. Yeah, so you, the, you place an, a ladder at this angle. Have to get to throw a 50 foot ladder. We're going to we're going to be hitting that overhead wire. It's not going to allow us to extend it to that height. At least to tell you to know the power's turned off. No, it's <laughs> it's regardless of whether it's live or, or dead, it's in the way. Mm -hmm. You'd have to like climb over it. Well, you know, the, like something. I said, no, the, an, the angle of yeah. the, an, the, the wire's in a position yeah. where you're just not going to get that ladder raised. And, and Jack, that yeah. building is set back 10 feet from the wall on the west end that we're talking about. And you have an additional 8 feet from the wall to the wire, which so that's 18 feet from the high point that you're talking about. Now, that is a four-story structure, not five, mm -hmm. on the west end. So with a 50-foot ladder, you go down the tracks and you push that ladder up and turn it into the building. I, I don't see it. I don't see how you're going to hit that wire. You may not at that point. You're right. But now we've got to go down and look at, is it going to hit the wall? Is it going to allow me to get into the building? That's why I said earlier that I can't really answer that question. OK. Chief, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, you too. Was there anything else that you had planned to present tonight, Peter? No, the only thing, just by way of quick summary, is, as you noted at the outset, we do have the parking plan uh, brief memo because what we did is compared some very comparable projects in close proximity that have actually the same or fewer parking spaces per unit. And in that memorandum, they the chocolate apartments, the schoolhouse at Lower Mills, and the Kurath apartments. And then you had asked if we had a plan or how the applicant would propose to manage as the manager of the building when it's built the uh, the parking spaces and this is our proposal certainly if the board thought there was something else that can be discussed and or you know, a condition that you <coughs> would impose but what we think is is reasonable this part i will paraphrase we're proposing a parking sticker and a towing program each rental unit unit will get one parking sticker so that's 57 spaces the remaining 14 we would allocate and keep available for visitor parking, which seemed to be one of your concerns. So that's about 25 percent. And there will be an on-site manager to be able to monitor that. Um, you know, theoretically, if it looked like there were spaces that weren't being used, you know, could the applicant, could the, man the manager within their discretion at some point say, well, if a tenant really wanted a second space, and it seems like we have plenty uh, of freed up spaces that aren't being used all the time by guests, you know, that could happen. But basically that's a proposal that we think is reasonable on the parking. Uh, so that's that aspect. The other thing that you had asked near the end was, and I think I said great minds think alike because certainly mitigation of a condition, although you, we certainly agree that it is an existing condition, the traffic, but you asked about with the applicant by way of some reasonable mitigation, agree to make a contribution towards a traffic signal if it were put in. 
And our answer is yes, we would contribute, we think, something like $10,000 is a reasonable figure because, again, we're not creating the problem and, you know, rough type of, this is not scientific, but, you know, a, a contribution somewhat proportional to the entire area. We would ask that if that is a condition that it be uh, paid up uh, in escrow with the town and if the traffic signal isn't put up in two years, you may want to say three, but in two or three years, then it would be returned. Uh, so that's a direct response to that question. Uh, the only other thing is a brief update uh, from from uh, either Phil, is Phil here? Yeah, or, yeah. Okay, thank you, you are Phil. From Alan and AJ, Phil Cordero, um, which uh, is basically where we are on the the uh, storm water management and the Con Converse Conservation Commission, um, and especially because you have the memo, which factually is true, that email that uh, mentioned uh, from Mr. Flynn, I believe it is, that- Mr. Lynch. Lynch. I'm sorry, Lynch. Sorry about that, Mr. Lynch. Uh, that, that says, and, he, and he's correct, but I didn't want the wrong you know, inference drawn from that, um, that there isn't data developed yet, but we are working on it. So if I may just have Phil Codero briefly summarize that for you. Sure. <coughs> Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, just to provide the update, as Peter laid the groundwork for, uh, for, we are continuing to do our research on the items listed in Joe Lynch's uh, letter dated today. The first step for us, really, as we outlined at the last meeting, is we have to review the pipes that are within Elliott and uh, Central. And we've tried to coordinate with a, um, a pipe camera company to go out and uh, do that work for us. We. Uh, picked up a vendor that was recommended by John and Joe, and we reached out to them, and we've spent the last few weeks coordinating with them. Uh, after some initial delays getting proposals from them to do the work, we finally signed up with them, uh, only to find out that their company actually shuts down for the month of December on their field crews. So we're scheduled to do the investigative work the first week in January, so right after the new year. And uh, once we have that data available, we'll analyze it uh, exactly as we agreed to with uh, Joe and, and uh, Mr. Thompson, uh, as outlined in the memo from today, and then we'll just further our discussions. Uh, we definitely we want to use this particular vendor uh, rather than trying to solicit some other ones to get it done a little bit quicker, because this is a vendor that has done work for the engineering department before. So we want to make sure that they're comfortable with who we have hired and the quality of their work so there's no question as to what we're providing and that it'll meet the standards that they have established under other contracts with the same vendor. So in progress, um, we don't have new information to present here at the hearing. Uh, likewise with the Conservation Commission, uh, you know, the, the meeting on their end was continued, rescheduled, um, and as soon as we have new information for both, we'll, we'll definitely provide it. What do you say about that, uh, Kathleen? Well, <laughs> as you know, I did tell you that uh, Mr. Lynch said that um, he was willing to meet with these folks but hadn't gotten any information. So we really, you know, the stormwater question is really the condition of the pipes or whether there's any connection to the pipes is really the question that we have, uh, the most important question. Sort of if there's a connection, where's the water going? Is it going directly into the river? <laughs> Agreed. We just want to make sure it's clear with the board, the intentional or not, I thought there was a, perhaps an inference in that, in that email and memo, uh, and, and frankly the same way Kathleen put it. It's not because it sat back on our hands. It turns out they wouldn't do the work in December, that investigative work. So I just want to reassure you and Kathleen and everybody that that's the only reason that we don't have more information. And Kathleen, why, why is that issue our issue, as opposed to the Conservation Commission. I still, I still am sort of troubled by that. I don't, why, well, is, why, why do you think that's our issue? Well, I do think it is an issue for this board in terms of the conditions and the permits and the waivers that have been requested. One of the waivers that has been requested is a waiver of local CONCOM regulations. Um, and I'm not quite, you know, I, I haven't read them personally myself, but 
I don't want the be really unhappy about the fact that the ZBA just sort of waived everything in terms of the CONCOM, and then it turns out that there's an issue that you know there's a local bylaw or some other issue with respect to the stormwater that hasn't been addressed. Um, I do think it is an issue. I mean, it is an issue every time with the ZBA about whether or not a project is going to um, have some impact on stormwater runoff and all those questions. <coughs> That's a natural question for the ZBA and under any. Um, kind of permit. So I don't think that we're, you know, saying, oh my gosh, we want you to, um, you know, put in all new pipes in the base, in the, in the street, but we need to know the condition. We need to know, the assumption is that water from this building is going to tie into town pipes. Um, and I don't think anybody knows the answer to that yet. But is the, are these issues issues that the CONCOM will deal with? All the issues that you've just I said. I do attention. not know that question. Okay. I haven't and attended the hearings for the CONCOM. I just think in normal circumstances, as Peter knows from the conversation that we've had before on other 40Bs, the, the issue about stormwater runoff, um, detention basins, all those kinds of things are, as you know, Peter and I, we've had that discussion lots of times with peer review and, and all that sort of project uh, and review of the project. Um, has always been something that's been part of the ZBA hearings. Is it your view that there are local bylaw provisions that are more stringent on these issues? I don't know. Okay. Sure. Yeah, I mean, Ted asked a good question because it's one that it, this issue kind of is a conundrum to me. I mean, do, do you know, does anyone know if the CONCOM has an opinion as to whether or not the local bylaws are more stringent than well, the state I, normal, regulations? Well, you know, in some other situations where I've been before boards before, you know, working with CBAs on these issues, there's been some report provided by the conservation agent um, or the conservation commission. As you know, where they've since submitted a letter in response to the ZBA's appeal to all town boards and commissions to put in comments. Um, I haven't seen anything from the Conservation Commission. But that is not an, an, you know, that's sort of a normal circumstance that there would be some input from the CONCOM to the ZBA. Isn't that correct, Peter? Sure, seen that before. sure. Yeah. It's certainly ordinary and expected that yeah. the CONCOM would. But, and I'm not going to say that silence means <laughs> end of set. discussion, <laughs> but the fact is I think it's relevant in terms of how 40B is set up with comment periods and six months on the hearings that it is, you know, that the, the any town agency, CONCOM or otherwise, has a duty to come forth with information that's relevant and, you know, they haven't done that yet. But a large part, if, if I may, Mr. Chairman, I think, if you have more questions for Kathleen, of course, you'll ask them. May I proceed a little bit with some thoughts on what? Well, I, just wanted, I just wanted to say that we did submit a letter from Joe Lynch from the DPW that had raised questions about this project. That information has been submitted to the board. And you know, the, um, you know, the engineering staff appeared at two hearings ago and said, you know, yes, we would meet with Alan and Major. We'd answer these questions that the DPW had raised on behalf of the board and on behalf of the town. And, and, and we're ready, willing, and able to do that when they get their information. And we understand that. Yeah, and that's I'm in sorry, the process. Peter, before you go off, just, you know, we, and we did meet with uh, Mr. Lynch and, uh, you know, Mr. Thompson reviewing those matters. And I think the consensus that we walked away with, as I testified last time, we have some more work to do, but we didn't identify project killers. You know, they, they felt that uh, what needed to be clarified could be clarified with some additional effort on our part, and that's what we did indeed um, agree to. And that's what's, mm -hmm. what we're in the prog progress on. Well, if, if as everyone seems to suggest, this is within our purview and that we have to deal with it, um, I'm certainly not going to be inclined to vote to give waivers um, of these provisions w without being absolutely convinced that this all works. And so I think we, I think I, there was a slight part of me that hoped we might close the public hearing tonight, but that doesn't look to me to be practical. I think we need to hear hopefully at the next and last public hearing that all this has been worked out to everybody's mutual satisfaction so that this issue, which to me seems far more soluble, if you will, than some of the other issues that we're dealing with, uh, can, we can put it behind us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
I certainly understand and respect that. And so I'm not trying to say, oh, don't worry about what's going to happen and close the hearing. Um, I don't know when the hearing would be closed. I know January 20. January 19th is the last day that we, that we can, okay. that we can do this. We can deal with that later. Um, but I think that in terms of, again, our job that I've expressed several times to give you a comfort level, which is another way of saying what you just said, that you're comfortable with what we're asking for. I think that there needs to be more discussion, which I'm trying to provide right now. You asked uh, Kathleen if the Conservation Commission would deal with it. I, I, I will simply say she said she didn't know, but I mean, there's no question that the Conservation Commission will indeed scrutinize all of the stormwater management issues and make sure that they uh, are satisfactory under the state DEP um, practices and performance standards. In my memorandum, in terms of the question of is it more stringent, you know, the hearing's still open and you have certainly the prerogative to further analyze it, but I haven't heard anybody refute what I said. It seems very clear to us because your bylaw then has regulations in the, I'm sorry, the bylaw then refers to regulations. The regulations are where the performance standards are, and the performance standards in Section 6 specifically say it's the state DEP CMR that are the performance standards. The few things that were not per se standards, um, they're more practical things, but I pointed out in my very specific memorandum uh, three or four things that are a little bit different, I don't know, stringent, more stringent is the right word, but things like um, the type of oil and uh, water separator, we said we'd do those. Uh, I can go through it, but there were three or four things that we said to the extent they might be deemed to be more stringent. We're not asking you to say in your decision the heck with them. We said we'll do what those things say on those very few items. So again, in terms of comfort, comfort level and being being ready to make a decision, and I don't mean tonight, but ultimately, I think that what I said, and I'm repeating here, absolutely speaks to that. So um, the other point is, which was uh, stated to you at the last hearing, <clears throat> directly related to stormwater, we are now saying that we will comply with the town DPW, I believe it's a DPW regulation or requirement, we will comply with their stormwater management permit requirements. We'll, we'll say we're going to get that permit. It's our risk. If we don't, either we're in trouble or sure we could come back later, but that's not what we're contemplating. So, you know, on very, the devil is in the details as they say, you know, I still believe that a waiver is appropriate, but it's not in the sense of just a complete carte blanche waiver. The things that are more stringent we say we'll comply with. The stormwater management uh, permit of your own town DPW we say, and we could ask not to under 40B, but we're not doing that. We say that we will get it. Um, so, you know, unless there is something that some uh, either conservation commission person or anybody else says, wait a second, there actually is something substantive that would be that would be lost as a condition if you grant the waiver I've asked for. I, I think we have satisfied. Uh, your concerns, and uh, at an earlier hearing, I'm um, certainly an appropriate condition because, again, I, I'm not saying that it's not within the domain for you to be comfortable on stormwater. No question that's a legitimate land use issue under 40B or 40A or anything. But what I am saying is, as was suggested, I think by Mr. Hurley a few hearings ago, based on what I just said, not just on generalities, I think it's totally uh, appropriate that you would simply have a condition that we have to obtain the uh, Conservation Commission order of conditions under the State Wetlands Protection Act. We have to get the TPW stormwater management permit um, that it's again to condition because we've stipulated as such, but it would also be a condition that we comply with points A, B, C. Those aren't the right letters, but the points in my memorandum as to the oil and water separator and uh, something else. Um, so that, that is an appropriate way to handle it. Perhaps you don't have to make that conclusion tonight because, you know, there's time for another hearing. We don't know how much information will be developed by then, but that's, you know, that's probably where I would be if there isn't complete information developed at that point. So I think that, again, it's those are specific responses that deal, mm -hmm. I think, very thoroughly with the situation. Can I just ask, when's the next um, CONCOM? Are you uh, we, it's in January, but 20th. we don't know that date. 
Was it January 20th, you think? think? No, that's, that's too late for us. That's too late for this. Well, we'll deal with this at the, at the next public hearing. Uh, I mean, it would be my idea, you know, subject to what everyone else thinks on the board. My idea would be to continue this one more time, um, to use that night to deal with this DPW issue to the extent that we can. We'll, one way or the other, we'll make a decision related to that. It'd be nice if the DPW people could come here that night and say everything's cool. That would be great, yeah. but we'll deal with it. And we if that's, should have the results of that pipe camera now. If that's not the case, we'll deal with it. Uh, and then I would propose that uh, we close the public hearing for sure that night. We're not going to ask for an extension or suggest an extension. Uh, and then uh, perhaps we'll begin our deliberations that night. Um, whether we finish them or not, I'm not sure, but we, we can begin them that night for certain. Let me, let me ask you each a question, though, because you have a great deal more experience in this than any of us do. Uh, in the, in, and I don't mean to suggest any decision on my part at all, because frankly, I've got an open mind on this still. But if the board were ultimately to uh, vote to grant this permit, what's the practice in terms of decision drafting conditions? I mean, is that, do, do people submit decisions that they think we ought to consider? Do they, do they sit, submit competing sets of, <laughs> sets of conditions? Um, I suppose that's how or, generous or, people are thinking about with their legal fees. But or, or, uh, or, do they, or do they expect three guys who work full time to sit down and, and labor over never done lengthy, a lengthy decision? Lengthy, uh, now, I have many. Well, you. I have yeah, forms. You, you, yeah, I don't. Right, right. I mean, I have decisions. Many decisions by different um, boards it, around the it state. It is a collaborative process. Okay. Um, and um, I, you know, Peter and I have worked on decisions um, in various sundry cities and towns. Um, we have started with. Um, I've started with a draft. You know, format. Um, usually, I've made notes as I've sat at the hearing as to what would be potential conditions. Um, you know, for example. Um, you know, no construction before 8 o'clock in the morning, um, you know, no construction on Sundays, uh, you know, that sort of thing. And so there are some s sort of those kinds of general kinds of conditions that go in. And then, you know, there's issues that have come up before the board as part of your deliberations. And, um, and so, you know, Peter and I usually have traded drafts um, to sort of say this is what, you know, what we're working with. When you've um, been op on opposite sides yes, of the, we've of the on V? Sides. Okay. We've never been on the same side. <laughs> um, but, uh, <laughs> but that's, we've represented different, different parties, but the interests yeah. have been aligned in numerous cases, yeah. such as in Wellfleet with an affordable housing project. Right, right. Okay, well, that's helpful. It, and, I mean, I, I, I yeah. agree. You know, I would say in you know, roughly half, if not more, of the ZBAs I've been in front of, they asked me to do the first draft, even if there's a town attorney involved. Mm -hmm. But, but I mean, that, that's your choice. You know, if you'd rather have Kathleen do a draft, as long as, you know, I get to share and we go back and forth. Or again, if, if you and Kathleen would rather have me do first cut, you know, it, that's certainly your prerogative, but I agree with that process. Okay. That's helpful. Um, what, what do we have for dates before January 19th? That, that's Thursday. Thursday. I don't know if you want to go earlier than that. I, I, I think the that. 15th works for me. Yeah, how much time to, to get that additional the investigation? It, it, yeah, it's probably better to be as much, uh, you know, <coughs> I, if, the, if the data is coming back January 5th or something, they're, they're actual inspections? Well, what, what ends up happening, and we've, you've asked this question in the past, and we've said, you know, we need a period of about two weeks to go through it. Uh, that's assuming we find favorable conditions, no surprises in the pipe. So we're planning to do that work January 5, which is the first available date. And then, you know, we'll jump right into it right afterwards and produce, which, you know, the 15th will make that fairly tight, but we'd do everything we could to, to make that happen. You know, and, and we would also assume that prior to being here on the 15th, we would want to have another sit down with DPW and just review and go through everything. and make sure we're uh, coordinated fully before walking back in the door here. So very tight, but you know, we recognize it has to be that way. One of the guys actually doing the pipe work. 
Um, they, we will know at the end of this week the exact date. Um, but then we need to, once we have that date, yeah, yeah, we need to yeah. coordinate it further with, with DVW sure. and, and the police department for detail. <laughs> so a lot of balls juggling in the air. Since we don't have a signal at that intersection. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. They won't be able to take advantage of a red light. Yeah, why don't we? Why don't we do the? Why don't we do the fifteenth, and let, and we'll deal with it. We're still, we're still working on the dates. How about the fourteenth? What's wrong with the fifteenth? There's, I with yeah. There's a, the affordable housing trust is a meeting on the fifteenth. Um, nineteenth is Martin Luther King, so. I don't know what that means for anybody. We can do the 15th. Okay, I'd rather do the 15th. You can move the trust meeting. Yeah. It's not critical. Okay. Of course, they have symphony tickets that night, too, so that's, <laughs> that's critical. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's fine. Is that all right with everyone? Ted? Frank? So. Yeah. All right, so we'll, we'll continue right. this to what hopefully will be the last session of this yes. public hearing. We'll close and we'll, uh, we'll begin to deliberate and uh, possibly we'll reach a, at least a decision in principle that night and then leave it to others to begin uh, putting that decision on paper. So that's, I think, the way we'll proceed. Thank you all. Kathleen will have to <laughs> do the first draft. <laughs> I'm going to be going to symphony that night. <laughs> Great. So the hearing is closed. Thank you. Thanks.